Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is going to be a really fun seminar. One of the um, positives about turning to a virtual world is we've broadened our definition of what uh, our seminars. And this is uh, part of that broadening definition. Uh, we've invited today Dustin Angel um, uh, to give us a talk focused on his conservation photography. But just a little bit about Dustin before we start. Um, Dustin is our Director of Education and he started here in 2013. And I always remember, um, because we were looking for a new education coordinator, he's uh, stepped up to the plate from coordinator to director in 2018. And I got, uh, I opened this package of information and it was unlike any resume I had ever seen in my life. And it sort of predicted exactly what it was going to be like with Dustin, because this was someone who was highly imaginative, obviously very interested in nature, but clearly a great photographer. He told his life in photos. The resume was basically a series of sort of photographic montages of all the things he'd done. Um, and um, we, took a, we took a chance with it. And uh, it's been one of the most wonderful, wonderful experiences to have Archibald um, have D uh, Dustin as our director of education. He's really creative. He's super knowledgeable in the field. And um, he's one of the most enthusiastic people you could ever hope to meet in your life. Um, before he came here, he worked at the, the Museum of Science and Technology in uh, Syracuse, New York. And he has a degree in photography and there's a train coming by so I'm going to hand over to Dustin now uh, his talk sweaty brows <laughs> bye there you go Dustin thank you so much Hillary I will always remember sending that to you and you writing back and saying oh this is great um can you send me an actual resume <laughs> and then and then the rest is history well, it's so good to be here with all of you. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce you to this community of conservation people in, in the area and to do it the best way I know how, which is through photographs and stories. The way that the talk is structured is there's three parts. First, we'll do an overview of the, of the Florida Stewards Photography Project. And then we will look at what's going on currently. I'm in a new phase of the project where I'm adding video interviews with, with the subjects, which I'm very excited about. So we'll take a look at that. Then the last part is about the project that we did here at Archbold with children at our summer camp two summers ago, which is still inspiring me every time I look at it. The, the kids did such a good job of taking the idea of um, finding their science futures uh, very seriously. My hope is that this is an inspiring talk for you. Maybe you'll laugh and cry and, and leave it feeling like you're ready to go and change the world. That's the, that's the plan today. So I've got this shared and let's get started. I like to start these talks by just briefly mentioning where I'm from. Hillary mentioned that I'm from upstate New York. When people think of New York, when you tell people you're from New York, they usually think of New York City. But to me, this is New York. In Syracuse, just a 20 minute drive will take you to beautiful places like this is Green, Lake, Green Lakes State Park, which is one of my favorite places uh, anywhere. In 2013, I left Green Lakes and, and Syracuse and came down to Archbold. If you've never been to Archbold, there it is on, on the map to uh, pursue a, a career in environmental education. That's the Francis Archbold Hufty Learning Center at Archbold. That's where I'm sitting right now broadcasting from you. There's a photograph from one of our summer camps. I have an, an amazing job, which is to to take all of the science and conservation and history um, and the rich um, biodiversity that's in the area. And I get to communicate that with, with children, with adults, college classes, with everybody. It's fantastic. And right now for the last seven months, I've been a bit like 
a musician who can't play any live concerts. So these virtual seminars have been just lifesavers, really. And I'm very glad that you are here with me today. Archbold is a nonprofit. The mission here is to build and share the scientific knowledge needed to protect the life, lands, and waters in the heart of Florida and beyond. I've put the map up here so you can get a sense of the region where Archbold works, but this is also the region I'm focusing on for this photography project. Down toward the bottom, you see Lake Okeechobee. That's the big, big lake that Florida has, and it's the mother of the Everglades. So the water from that is what feeds the Everglades system. But many people don't realize that north of that is where the water comes from. Sometimes it's called the headwaters of the Everglades or the Northern Everglades or Florida's heartland. It's a 2.6 million acre uh, piece of Florida where the water is flowing to Lake Okeechobee. That's a, that's a lot of land. The right at the top of that map where we're zooming in, that's Orlando. So it's everything south of Orlando going to Lake Okeechobee. Archbold um, is the, the, or the, the two big orange blobs. <laughs> that's Archbold, that's 20,000 acres. But you'll notice there's lots of little orange markers on, on the map as well. And part of the, part of the point of, of this slide is to show you that even though Archbold is, uh, has our own properties, the researchers here are working throughout this whole vast region on private lands, on federal lands, state lands, doing all kinds of uh, research projects on endangered species, water quality, fire ecology, anything with nature, you name it. The other thing that's important about this area is it is a uh, it is the rural part of Florida. I mean, there's some other rural parts too, but but right in here we're surrounded with development on the coasts and then Orlando north of us. But we still have this beautiful um, part of Florida with many many beautiful natural areas and intact corridors where bears and panthers can still move relatively safely through the center of the state. So it's a very important place for conservation. And, and it seemed like uh, if I was going to tell a story about conservation through portraits, it's, uh, it's a great place to start. When I moved down here, I soon became immersed in a community of people. Most of them were Archbold researchers, Archbold volunteers, um, and then people that we work with at different agencies and other nonprofits. So this is, this is what the, the work actually looks like in the field when I'm talking about conservation. It's, it's not people, uh, sometimes it's people sitting at their desks inside, but, but often it is people outdoors with, with wet boots and sweaty brows. And that is, the, that is the world that I want to convey with these portraits. And it's, it's the world that I'm um, immersed in. After I'd been here about a year and a half uh, and, and felt like I was starting to get a sense of what was going on um, with, the, with the environmental issues and with the science in the area, I, I thought, you know what, let's just experiment, take my camera out and I'm gonna bring a little flash with me and set it on a tripod. I'll go out with my wife, Emily, who at the time was an Archbold biologist uh, and the crew uh, that she was with. We'll see if we get any cool portraits. And the, the, this is the first one that we did, October, 2014. And I loved it. I was so happy with the results here. Uh, and that even with just a little $40 flash and a $20 wireless connector, I could start to add some studio lighting, but also have the environment as, as a subject. So in these pictures, you have, you have the person representing themselves, but they're also representing their occupation and the environment that they're in is the place that they work. So that's representing itself too. And after I took those first three pictures, it was pretty clear to me that if I, if I wanted to make the commitment to continue this project, uh, I could do it. And there would, it would be a project that would feel 
very important to me and that I could continue for years and years and years, but that would also be helpful um, as a document of this time, of the people, of these environments. And so right now I have, I'm up to like 96 people, something, something like that, that, that I photographed for this. Pretty proud about that, but I'd love to have like 500 people. So we got to keep chugging along. And as you, as you look at these photos, you'll start to notice that there are a lot of uh, different kinds of habitats and different kinds of jobs. All three of these people right here, they all work on private ranch land. Private ranch land makes up about a million acres of that uh, headwaters region in the map. And it's a very important place for conservation. So um, I photographed lots of, lots of uh, researchers that, that work on ranches. You also might notice that there's a certain style to these. And uh, all of them, for the most part, fit this the style or this template. We are looking directly, uh, you know, into the into the eyes, making eye contact with the subjects. We can see either most of their body or their, or their whole body and, and the environment that they're that they're in. They also all have their objects from their job. You'll notice you don't see man-made objects in here. Um, I tried once to have someone leaning up on a, a vehicle and it just <laughs> didn't really work. So I, I, I think there's value in if you have hundred or hundreds of photos, setting yourself some rules as a photographer, how you want to um, make those pictures look. The, the other thing is trying to kind of with that studio lighting, make these look a little bit like movie posters. I think of them kind of as superhero Movie, po movie posters. And I do want to celebrate the hard work that these, that these folks are doing. We're also making direct eye contact. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that. In our real life, when we make direct eye contact with someone for more than just a couple of seconds, it's, um, it can be a transformative experience. It's a little scary too. It's not something that you do with, with everyone. They say that the eyes are the windows of the soul. And photographs like this, they're not uh, a two-sided conversation, but we are simulating it. And you can look into these people's eyes for as long as you want. I, I think that it is transformative and even can be a spiritual experience to do that. When I think of the idea of photographing a community having a hundred photos or, or more, I, I think there's something really special about that because if you can look into the eyes of all those people, you're not gonna forget them. It's, it's uh, about empathy. It's about knowing that they exist. And once you make that connection, you um, might appreciate what they're doing a little bit more. I mentioned that it is a bit one-sided. These, these subjects all agreed to be in these photos and they know that they're going to be on a website and printed up in an, in an art gallery and people are going to stare at them. That, that is a little bit vulnerable. But at the same time, these expressions are, are strong expressions. They are confident, self-confident expressions. And I think that what they're doing is they're saying, um, I am here, I am comfortable in who I am and what I do, and I want us to have this back and forth. I want to look in your eyes while you look in my eyes and um, have, have a, a serious conversation. Some people ask, why aren't they smiling? And, and that's why when you're, when you're having a serious conversation, you're, you're not sitting there with a big goofy grin on. <laughs> this, this project though has um, a, you know, a long history of other photographers that have tried an ambitious projects that look at either people's occupations or trying to photograph a, a community of people. So I wanted to show some of the projects that inspire the work that I'm doing. I'm going to not spend too much time on each one, but let's just take a look at a few of these. And I, I, I love these. So there's um, Germany and, and, the 19, and a lot of these are taken in the 1920s, August Sanders' work. 
Irving Penn, who was also a famous photographer for, for the, in the uh, fashion world, but then did incredible, incredible projects like, like this one, Small Trades. Diane Arbus, you notice her style is different. She's not photographing everybody with the same template like, like I'm doing and like those other people were. But she, but she was trying to document a wide community of communities of people. She was uh, seen as someone who photographed um, the disenfranchised. She would go to circuses and, and photograph the circus performers. She would work with the people that were, uh, yeah, disenfranchised uh, and odd. Sometimes she would photograph folks who weren't in that category, but she'd photograph them in the way that made, made their normalcy seem odd. The last one here is Richard Avedon, who did this fantastic project. And I think he did about, oh, I think he was like 700, 50 photos, something like that over, over a few years on this project. And he would go to uh, like state fairs and things like that. Now, what we notice in all of these projects, I, I notice one thing in all of them, which is that the photographer does not appear to be part of the community. The photographer is distant from these people. And some of these have had, had some um, criticism of saying things like, um, was Diane Arbus uh, a tourist going into these people who were not as well off as her? Or with Richard Avedon, is he making fun of these people? And I can't you know, give the answers for all of those things. But when I think of my own projects, I am doing something a little bit different because I'm focusing on a, a community that I'm a part of. And when I say I'm a part of it, it's not just that I work at Archbold. Here, here's a Halloween party at my house a few years ago. I'm the wizard on the left. <laughs> there's, there's Emily in the middle um, with Sting. And in this photo, most of these people are Archbold employees. In fact, 12 of the people in this photo, in this picture, um, are in the Florida Stewards photo project. If you are a photographer watching this, my advice to you is, is not to go and be a, uh, a photo tourist in some other community, but to look at what community do you have access to um, and tell that story of, of your own family, of your own friends and the people are, that are around you. There's a, there's a motto that Spider-Man has, which is with great power must also come great responsibility. And that is, is how I feel about this, that because of my position here, um, I have a, a unique window into this, this community of people. And because of my photography background, I feel like I have to tell this story. Let's move on to what is going on right now, this, this new phase um, in my work. So, during the pandemic, I can say I hardly picked up a camera for about six months. And now I've, I've just started doing some more photo shoots. This is one of the last ones I did right before the pandemic started. So I've got, um, I think I've got seven portraits. I'm going to pop up of these new ones. And some of them I have video interviews that I'll, that I'll show you too. This one I don't have a video for. But take a look here. And if you've got your keyboard handy, what do you think is going on in these pictures? I would love to see what your guesses are because after photographing so many people, it can be difficult for me to find new occupations or new, new equipment. And when Chelsea brought this out for the photo shoot, this like octopus looking thing, I, I knew that um, there was still more I could photograph and it wasn't just going to be people with binoculars and um, you know, and and a, and, a, and a field notebook. So I'm gonna let me pull up um, the chat. Did anybody put anything in there? What do you think? Oh, nobody's really sure. I, I think. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll let you know. Chelsea and Becky study a very rare bird called the Florida grasshopper sparrow, only found in Florida, and it lives. Uh, it lives on dry prairie habitat, like we're seeing right here, and it nests on the ground. 
there's there's literally no trees to nest on <laughs> they nest on the ground that's there's that's what they do um but because there's so few of them what biologists like chelsea and becky are doing is trying to protect every nest what Chelsea has there um, on the ground is a fence. So she'll set up a fence around the nest. And then the octopus there is stuffing like, like you would have in, in, uh, in your couch. That goes along the bottom of the fence to try to keep snakes from getting in there. Becky has a shovel because her job is to remove the um, imported red fire ants. And I've never met anybody that liked fire ants. <laughs> and if, if you don't know, they are an invasive species. If you're a ground nesting bird and, you, you, and you've got fire ants there, it's not a good combination because they can go right into the nest and kill, kill the nestlings. So not only do we put the, the fence around, but Becky's there to try to destroy those, those fire ant nests. What's not in this photo is um, some of the other equipment she has, not just the not just the um, shovel. Okay. This is one of my all-time favorite photos that I've taken of Alicia. If you are not coming from Florida and you're tuning in from somewhere else, how could I describe field work for a Florida biologist? It's like working in a sauna. <laughs> it's it's could be you know 85 degrees out in the middle of winter and in the summer the humidity is uh is pretty intense so imagine working on a, a working on a fire so here's alicia with the you know thick protective clothing on this is the day after a prescribed fire i've helped out on a couple of fires and yeah it's 80 degrees out 90 degrees out you've got the humidity plus the forest is lit on fire it's pretty intense. I'm so grateful for people like Alicia. It's tough work, it's dangerous work, but we're really indebted to them because prescribed fire is, I would say, is the number one tool for habitat restoration and just proper land management. Florida is the lightning strike capital of North America. And uh, almost all of the, the land surface in Florida, before you know, before there was all the roads and houses and things, uh, burnt um, prairies, like in the last photo, that because of lightning would burn pretty regularly every one to three years. The Florida scrub, like we see in this picture, might burn every ten to thirty years with a lightning strike. But today, because of all the roads, the habitats are very fragmented, and a lightning strike might not set off a fire. So instead what happens is they get overgrown. You can see behind her, that's a bit overgrown. It was ready for a fire. And if you don't burn, it gets more and more overgrown until a wildfire does come. And then that wildfire is gonna be very hard to control and could be dangerous. So because of people like Alicia, we actually can prevent forest fires before they happen with these. It's good for people. But the other part is that the, the plants and the animals, they're adapted for fire. Florida has all of these cool species that if you take fire away, they're gone. The Florida grasshopper sparrow I just mentioned previously is one of those. Um, Florida scrub jays would be another one. Gopher tortoises would be another one. Here's Scott and Seth. These are both uh, plant guys. Though Seth also um, does a lot of work with, with lichen. So he's a plant ecologist and a lichenologist. And we just, Scott and I just went out um, about a week ago and took this one. This, this is right before the storm hit. <laughs> and luckily we got a good photo. Uh, I did interview him. I'm gonna show you a little clip. We didn't get to finish the interview because the storm came in. We got completely soaked. When, when I show people these photos, there's so much information in there. There's, there's the objects that they're holding and the environments that they're in. And for most viewers, if they're not um, in, in that career themselves, or they don't have me to, there to describe it, they don't know what they're, they don't know what these people are holding. 
But now that it's so easy with a cell phone to record interviews, I'm very excited that I can open these portraits up and um, help people understand what is going on in them. And also, I think, makes the connection stronger, too, because you can actually hear the person's voice and, and see them. So let's um, watch. Scott is going to tell us what is it that he's carrying with him. So I have a plant press. This is used to collect plants and make them into really nice specimens and put them into uh, kind of herbaria, they're called. Um, so I would take these, these living plant materials and put them in each little sleeve and give them a nice label and then house them away for, you know, in perpetuity, really. So you could look at them 100, 200, 300 years from now and see what was growing here at the time. Um, when I'm out in the field looking at botanical things, I use a little hand lens, sometimes a little ruler to measure certain parts on different plants and to kind of see them, you know, and I can't carry a necessarily a microscope out with me in the field. Um, always have a Garmin just to maybe document some rare things and um, pull them up on a GIS later and just kind of see where they're growing. Camera is always essential. I want to take pictures of certain plants. Um, it's good to have pictorial versions of these things as well, instead of just housing them up here. Uh, That's Scott telling us a little bit about what uh, what he was holding on. And the, the idea here is um, I, I want these photos to go to work. I don't want to just take pretty pictures. So we at, at Archbold and other biological field stations are, are recognizing the value in having short videos, say five minutes long, where scientists do explain their careers we get invited to do career fairs at, at colleges and high schools and um, middle schools and elementary schools. So I'm really hoping to create a library of, of short interviews that can help kids learn about these careers. Because if you don't have a role model for a job like, like this, it's very unlikely that, that, a, that a child would end up wanting to, to become a plant ecologist. If they don't know any of them. Um, so I'm pretty excited about where this might end up going. Besides just questions of what is your career or what are you holding, we can also ask more personal questions and get to see how do these folks who spend their whole careers focused on conservation, how do they think about these things? Now, this is Michelle Dent who I've, I've um, been lucky to call a friend for many years while I've been here. And she is moving. This is her last month and she's moving to North. Um, where is she going? To New Mexico. And I'm gonna be very sad that she's gone. I'm very happy we were able to get out a couple of weeks ago and, and do a portrait shoot before she left. I asked her, if you could talk to your 15 year old self, what would you wanna tell her? in regards to you know, science as a career. So this is her answer. As a 15 year old, I had no clue that a job like this even existed. And if I did, I would be, I would have started working towards it way back when, instead of when I was an adult. I, I think that just educating kids about what kind of things they can do because a lot of them have no clue that things like this you can actually observe birds and monitor birds as a job when you tell them that it's just eye-opening for them and sometimes it changes their lives and i can tell you that um right after that there, I don't see if they can, there you go. That right, right after that part, I didn't show it there, but there was definitely, there were some tears. That, that was a heartfelt moment with her. And that's something that um, being able to easily record without a lot of gear with a cell phone makes possible, spontaneous moments like that. Here's the last of the videos that I'm gonna show today. And then we'll look at the children's project. <laughs> so there's there's my wife again, Emily. It had been you know five years uh, since I photographed her the first time, and we thought we need to get out here and do this again. She had come home from from work with um, a story of an, an animal encounter, and I said we need to go back to that same spot 
and kind of, uh, you know, reclaim it or take a portrait there. So we have, so for me, I was thinking I've got an excuse to tell the story. So here she is, it's about two and a half minutes long, explaining, uh, tell, telling her um, animal encounter she had one day while out uh, in, the, in a seasonal pond. So at the, at the property I work at, we put out these acoustic monitors to detect the presence of these endangered Florida bonneted bats. Uh, it comprises of a monitor and pole and microphone setup that we put all around the property to detect the presence of the bats as they fly over at night. And then we go back and pick them up and analyze the data after that. I had gone to pick up one of these monitors in a marsh and the monitor was about half a mile out into this marsh. So I parked my truck and I walked through the area that my picture was taken in and uh, the marsh water was about knee deep. So as I'm walking through there, I, you know, there was so much vegetation and I was making so much noise moving through it that I figured I'd be scaring away any other occupants there might be out there. However, I took another step and the world exploded around me and this big mature alligator whipped around to look at me and his head was about that big at least. And I found out later they actually sleep underwater and that's why he didn't hear me coming. I must have woken him up from a nice nap. And so he'd gone around and he was looking at me and I'm looking at him and I'm looking around for any sort of stick or something that I could defend myself with and there's nothing. And you know, it might've been in my imagination cause I was so nervous at that point, but I thought I saw him starting to edge toward me. So I took a step back and I tripped and fell into the water. And then I started to panic and I'm thrashing around and I'm screaming. I'm like, no, 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 over and over. I was just waiting to feel his jaws clamp onto my leg. And I'm thinking, you know, this is where I'm gonna die, right? But my commotion really scared him and he turned around and booked it out of there. And he went so far and so fast that I, I heard him leaving for about the next 15 seconds as he got out of there. So then I got up and I'm shaking and my heart's pounding and I still had to go get that monitor set up. So I had to walk maybe another quarter mile to find the monitor. You know, I'm shaking the whole time waiting to step on something else. But then I felt better when I found it because then I had a pole in my hand. So I spent the next hour as I left the area, you know, poking every foot as I went just to make sure there were no other gators in there to step on. <laughs> I love that story. And I remember after that happened, uh, being at lunch at Archbold and telling people, oh my gosh, you know, Emily stepped on an alligator. And the Archbold response to that was, Something like, well, who hasn't stepped on an alligator? <laughs> People are like, yeah, you know, if you work in the wetlands every once in a while, that kind of thing happens. And the alligators are uh, j just, you know, they just take off. So that's just part of being a biologist. I want to uh, talk about this project that we, that we did with the summer campers here in 2019. For me, this was a total dream come true. I'd been running summer camp for years and I, at this point had been doing the photo project for, for years. And I always wanted to combine them, but wasn't sure how to do it. And uh, this just came together. It was um, just so wonderful. The way, that, the way this worked is we, I started by just showing the kids the photos. We, I'd hold up a picture and we'd talk about it. I'd ask the kids, what, do you, what is this person holding? What do you think they do? Um, what's going on in this photo? And that was great. I mean, um, kids love art and they love pictures and, and they had no problem jumping in and offering their ideas about what was going on in the pictures. Then they were asked to draw themselves to choose what type of, of scientist they wanted to be and make a drawing of themselves. These were fantastic. These were just so good. So here's, we had a hundred, we had a hundred kids participate in this, uh, seven to 12 year olds. Some of the, some of the campers drew themselves very specifically as imitations of the, of the uh, people in the photos. And I had mentioned a little while ago needing needing role models. If, if you don't see somebody that you can identify with in a career, it's unlikely you'll go into that career. 
I love the drawing of Johanna's on the right. Can you can you tell what she did? That's her, but she's pregnant in the photo because of that picture of Stacy. And because of Stacy as a role model, she knows that she can be a mom and she can be a scientist. Here's a couple more of these. A lot of the boys loved the photo of Kevin with the smoke around him. So that was the, the most, uh, you know, the, the, most of the boys wanted to, to be like Kevin. Uh, and most of the girls wanted to be like Stacy, actually, which is one of the reasons I took that photo of Alicia. So now I have a really cool picture of a woman in that job with the fires. And I took those photos of, of Seth and Scott. So now I have for a plant biologist, some really cool, uh, tough looking guys doing that job, those jobs. So some of the kids were not as directly inspired. You can see on the left, Epic is holding a, an alligator. I can't tell if they're friends or what's, or if he's getting eaten. The Carolina in the middle drew herself um, as a penguin with a human head. And Dallas on the right didn't exactly go into a conservation career, but he's got himself as a robot inventor. The next day, the children were able to uh, take on their science personas. I brought out the same equipment that the researchers use and brought out the lighting that I use for the adults. You can see in the photo there. And they took this so seriously. I was so proud of them. Um, they, could, they could dress as a specific type of, of researcher or they could have a mix, whatever they wanted to do. Some of them have relatives that work at Archbold. So, so Serenity's dad is a biologist at the ranch. I showed his picture earlier. And I love that she was so proud of her dad. She wanted to, to mimic his, his picture. And Ava, her big sister, Lexi, works at Archbold as a plant biologist today, but started as a seven-year-old at our summer camp. So I love the, the next generation. Is, is here at Archbold and they've got some wonderful role models. The next part was I, I, gave, I, print, I printed out the photos and the kids could look at their photo and they were asked to write a message. So I'd like to share a few of these messages here. And for me, one of the things that they showed is that every child and every person has a different way of identifying with nature and science. For, for Katie here, um, it's, her connection came from her pets, from having, um, having a pet bird, and that made her want to help protect the wild birds. Our camp doesn't spend a lot of time on doom and gloom. It's pretty positive. It's about getting kids outside and having fun. But we do talk about some of the issues like invasive species. And here's Anthony, an 11 year old who um, took that part pretty seriously. So when he dressed up, he really wanted to show, I'm going to take care of invasive species and be a land manager. Another boy that dressed up as a land manager had a different connection to nature. He wants to light things on fire <laughs> and that's okay. Uh, what I love about the project is it allows, and, and environmental education, outdoor ed in general, allows kids to choose what they're interested in and whatever path they have that connects them to it, um, you, can, you can do that in environmental education. There's flexibility as an educator. Here's Alan, treat nature like kindness. I think you should treat nature fairly and you should not pollute nature. And I fell in love with nature when I was much younger when I lived by the woods. I will help any animal that is hurt and not feeling good and protect nature and the wildlife that it has. Waylon did not want his photo, want, did not want his face in his picture. And I, I wasn't sure what to do. So the next day I went to him and said, what if we don't have your face in it? And then he's like, okay, we can do that. So we went back out and, and for, for him, 
his re- connection with nature comes through his relationship with dad and uh, with his dad and uh, hunting with his dad. So I ended up, even though this photo didn't have his face in it, it ended up being one of my favorite pictures out of all of these. Dallas is still wanting to build robots. <laughs> okay, I thought this was a, a really nice one too. Um, basically the golden rule. I believe the animals should be treated how we want to be treated. We want to be treated with kindness and to be treated fairly. We're all living things. We have the power to help those in need. Animals have a right as much as we do to anything they need to do. Thank you, Atia. Before they left camp on, um, on Friday, they received framed versions of their photos and their messages and summer camp t-shirts. So as I, as I wrap up here, just a, a final thought or two, uh, the project is called Florida Stewards and I'm, I want to celebrate these, these folks who have dedicated their careers to you know, working on sustainability and you know, understanding and protecting um, wildlife and wild places in Florida. But Florida stewardship does not belong to them. They don't own Florida stewardship because stewardship is something for all of us to participate in. My hope is that the work that they do is not done in vain. And the only way that will happen is if we all claim that title of Florida steward. And I hope that seeing these photos gets you excited to think about the ways in your own life, uh, little things you could do every day to, uh, to help the environment. So my, my hope is, I imagine a hundred years from now, children being born uh, in Florida, and I want them to be able to visit those same wild places in these photos. I hope that the Florida grasshopper sparrow and gopher tortoise and Florida panther is out there for them. These Florida stewards are trying to make that happen but it takes all of us to, to make this happen. So that's my, my final message. And I'm happy to spend maybe the next 15 minutes or so answering questions if we've got some, if we've got some questions. So I will uh, stop sharing my screen. Okay, um, so first of all, Dustin, that was really wonderful. Um, I have seen many of these photos many times before, and there were some really lovely new ones, and I love the new videos. And um, I, they still actually uh, catch me off guard and make me make me feel quite emotional when I watch them. So thank you. You're really making a connection that's hard for the rest of us to sometimes make so powerfully. Um, I, I don't, I'm going to encourage anyone, if anyone wants to ask a question about, uh, about Dustin's, uh, Dustin's work, um, I do see that there's uh, one comment, uh, you know, this is perfect for a traveling expedition, ex- exhibition, not expedition, exhibition, Dustin. Do you want to tell us about your, um, your uh, exhibit at Bock Tower Gardens? I think for, people might be interested in that. I'm glad that somebody put that in there because I probably should have mentioned that, right? <laughs> right, like right now. Show, I'm like the chat show host helping you out. You know? <laughs> right, right now there's an exhibit of, uh, I think there's 18 of them, of these port. You can see there's one behind me. So I print them, I print them on metal, uh, on aluminum. And there's 18 of these prints at Bach Tower Gardens in Lake Wales. If you've never been to Bach Tower, this is a great excuse to go. It is a gorgeous place. It's both a botanical garden and a nature preserve and they, they have nature trails. Um, they have a gorgeous Carillon um, tower on top of, a, there's not a whole lot of hills in Florida. They've got a 300 foot elevation part of um, the, same, the same region of Florida we're in the Lake Wales Ridge and a beautiful tower on top with bells. So go, go check it out. And this is this has shown in, in other venues around here. We've had the photos up at Archbold. Um, the South Florida State College in Avon Park has put them up. Stetson University is, has had them up before too. And they actually brought me in to do a, a, a similar My Science Future project with their college students in the environmental club. So that was fun. They didn't dress up to do that part, but we photogra- I photographed them and they wrote messages uh, about, um, about conservation. So that, that was really nice. 
if you have uh, if you have a gallery or you or you know a place that would love these, um, I don't I don't have a plan for them after December, so they would they would happily go to another exhibit somewhere. So there was a couple of questions about how long the exhibit would be up at Bock Tower Gardens. So I think it's the end of the year, Dustin. Is that correct? We, it, it, that's correct, but we don't we don't we don't because of the pandemic we don't have an actual end date. Right. So they're okay. there till the end of the year, but it's you know it's just throwing everything off. So I don't know when I don't know if Bach has another show booked yet. They might be up for another few months after that. You were the so, last one in, so you've been hanging up there for a while. Yeah, so yep, exactly. There's a couple of questions in the chat. One from Suzanne Copter. Hi, Suzanne. Um, some people don't like to be photographed. How do you convince them to participate? I'm wondering if you have somebody in mind specifically. Maybe you're, you're thinking of a relative or somebody that doesn't like to Maybe be yourself. <laughs> some people don't. I some some folks um i've tried several times and then just say no and you don't want to pressure somebody and push them and you've got to move on you can't can't force them to it to do it and with these with these photos it's so much uh, a partnership we're out there for an hour um you know sometimes it's super fast you're done in a half an hour other times you're there for two hours and you you have to have um, you have to get the person comfortable. They have to want to do this or you're not going to get that expression that you need. So you cannot force this. I have had some people where I've asked and then they said no. And then six months later, I asked them again and they said yes. Uh, for, for my process, I'm very slow when we're out photographing. And I, I do think that helps. If you're there for an hour photographing, the first half an hour of photos might not be good and but you work through it with digital I, there's no reason why you can't take photos and then you go over and you, with your camera and you show them zoom in here's what you look like and they'll say oh i'm squinting there or oh okay uh, and you work together and you find that expression and usually it's towards the end those last few shots where you get that one that just pops and it's the perfect perfect shot um, everybody's different some people stand there and you don't even have to give them any direction and all of a sudden they're just like and you, oh i mean you just get that photo and it's done other people it takes a while it takes a long time to get it i have to say your good wife emily put is pointing out in the chat that she's a horrible model and fights the process the whole way so you but you eventually get some wonderful photos of her she's so the worst to... person i've ever tried to photograph <laughs> well but... maybe this uh, maybe this is a good lead into the a question in the q a dustin you know, you're just discussing part of your community you're documenting, unlike some of those other photographers. Are there any issues with being closer to your subjects than maybe other photographers you mentioned? I'm not sure what angle that, that person is trying to, to get at, like um, an, an issue with maybe not uh, being too biased or, or something like that. Um, in the case of these portraits, I don't think that's an issue. Um, if you were trying to do something that was totally uh, photojournalism uh, and, want, and you didn't want the author, the photographer to be in it, then maybe that would be an issue. But I, um, I embrace that I'm part of the photo shoot. Um, I think it was Richard Avedon who's a who's amazing um who said something like that every portrait is a portrait of the photographer mm -hmm. and i i think that to a certain degree that's true when you when you, i'm choosing the i'm taking hundreds of pictures and i'm choosing that final that final one and everybody all hundred of these people pretty much are making the same expression and they and to some degree are acting to, to uh, they're playing off of an hour of being with me as I'm trying to coax out this uh, ideal vision I have of what I want to want them to look like and the um, impression I want them to give off, which is 
which is very manipulative in, in a sense. Um, but I think that we do have to recognize that photography is just as much of um, uh, a, a fiction as a, a, a story or a movie. It's capturing light, it's real, but there are so many, so many choices that the photographer makes of what to include in the photo. Um, to how high I wanna be. I'm often uh, kneeling on the ground when I photograph these. There's so many choices and I, I try to embrace my role in these. Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I went on a little long there, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank so you. Um, there's uh, more of a technical question here. What's your favorite type of natural and favorite type of artificial light or be the combination? Well, I, everybody who uh, gets into nature photography knows that the golden hour before the sun sets is pretty spectacular. I have done these portraits at all times of the day. I have that external flash that I'm using. So even if it's noon and normally there would be the raccoon eyes, the dark shadows here, I have the flash to act as the primary light. Um, so you can, you can do it any time of day. And the, and the reason that happens is um, sometimes it's me just going out with them for a morning of their working. And I'm, and I'm saying, you know, when you get a chance, can you come over here and take some pictures with me? So it might not be till 11 o'clock that they have a chance to do that photograph. When we're just picking, hey, we're just gonna do a photo shoot. It's either um, in the morning, a little after sun sunrise, or it's those last couple hours before the sun sets. Yes, well, I think we've probably answered most of the questions. Um, what I was going to um, what I was going to suggest is uh, there's a suggestion in the chat. You know, will prints or a book be available? I don't know if uh, Dustin. We, we know. I know we don't sell postcards of portraits of our own staff at the front desk. It would feel a bit weird in some ways. I think Dustin. I don't know about you, but a um, book is my the book is dream. The yeah, I've made. Uh, little versions just like for those summer campers to look through but uh, mm -hmm. the dream is to have a, a really nice book and um i don't know when that i'm always like oh, i'm about to do that but i also would love to have several hundred photos to choose from and pick the, the top you know 50 or something like that mm -hmm. so hopefully someday <laughs> Well, we should, um, on that note, uh, with the idea of you taking hundreds more photos, which is a really encouraging idea, I'd just like to thank you very much for such a great uh, seminar, Dustin, uh, adding to the variety and range of things that we're learning about. And thank everybody who's um, been online and listening. Uh, appreciate you joining us. And also, I'm going to hand it over to Laura, because I know she has a couple of announcements about upcoming seminars. But again, Really appreciate it, Dustin. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn my uh, camera off here. Thank you all for joining us.